Welcome to Unbreakable Spirit, stories of inspiring and thriving with Jennifer Seven, co-author of a book that is part of the Sisterhood Folios, a number one international bestseller. This is a podcast about real women who've overcome tremendous obstacles and come out on the other side to thrive. Whether their hardships were financial, relational, or health, these women dug deep and found the light out of the dark to rise from the ashes, to find the ability to forgive, to love, and to live an authentic, joyful life. Now, here is your host, Jennifer Seven. Welcome, listeners, to episode 24 of Unbreakable Spirit. And I have a really amazing guest here today. I have Brie Tartaglione. And she has quite the story. It's really a story of health and a crisis that she went through that she's going to share with us. But it was pretty profound and amazing. And we'll get to hear all about that in just a moment. But I want to tell you a little bit about Brie. Brie is a motivational speaker. She's also a certified school counselor, emotional wellness coach, business owner, and podcaster in the field of personal development and mental well-being. She holds two master's degrees in school and counseling psychology from Columbia University, and she's working on completing her advanced certificate in clinical mental health counseling. She now lives and practices her work in New York City. So let's just dive into Bree's story here. I know that she's passionate about helping individuals, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but pivoting from their problems into possibilities, and she really strives to foster an environment of intentional self-work, healing, and discovery. And this really started from the moment, and she's, this is the story she's going to share with us, that she physically took her first steps, and I'm going to say this that this is her first steps again in life on her 29th birthday. So this is the story we're going to hear today. So Brie, welcome. I'm excited to have you here and thank you for being willing to share your story. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you today. Well, let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's, let's go back and find out what happened. Yeah, so the story is lengthy for sure, but I can sort of give you the the sound bites version and then I'll be happy to expand wherever you want to push in and understand more and learn more. Sounds great. So in March 2020, which is a really trigger time for the whole world, that was really at the very beginning of everything shutting down, the world sort of really coming to a close with COVID. And as the world was shutting down, so too was my body. Mm. And I was 28 at the time. And interestingly enough, it was actually, this all took place. It started the day before we went into remote work in New York City. So I was working for a company that worked in school systems. So I was a counselor, but I was working in several schools in New York City. And my company had a full board meeting on March 16th, which was a Monday. It was the day for all of New York City schools to basically get together with their teams and figure out how they were going to do this remote learning thing. Mm, because yeah. New, New York was really ahead of everybody else, right? Because it, New York was getting hit so hard. You know, I don't actually know what the what the timelines were for other places, but I, I do know for New York, this was, it was uh, mid-March. So mm-hmm. I know it was, it was definitely getting hit hard at the time with COVID. But March 17th was going to be the first day of remote learning. So I'm with my company in this boardroom meeting, really trying to figure out how we're going to do this thing. And uh, typically I'm a really active participant, someone who is raising their hand, coming up with ideas, just definitely very engaged, especially in major conversations in a company. So I was not myself in this meeting and my, everyone started to notice it. And obviously I noticed it as well, but it was because I had this weird tingling sensation that started in my feet 
And it felt very much like pins and needles, like that your foot falls asleep or you're like mm-hmm. asleep and you get that sensation. That's what it felt like, but it wasn't going away. So it was there and it was really sort of bothering me and distracting me. And then as the day went on, that tingling sensation, it didn't go away or subside. It actually started to grow up through my legs. So by mid-afternoon, it had grown through my feet, up through my calves. By late afternoon, it had really grown up through my thighs. And at this point, you know, I had that ever known, like, you know, something strange is happening. Like, I feel really weird. Like I'm okay. Cognitively I'm here. I can still contribute. But like, if I'm antsy, like my legs just feel really strange right now. I imagine so- because when your foot feels, falls asleep, it's kind of a horrible feeling. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it's very uncomfortable. And so it, the sensation at that point wasn't to that intensity where it was really unbearable. Cause even when your foot falls asleep, it's like, you have to shake it out. You got to yeah. get it out. You can't, <laughs> can't concentrate. It wasn't to that intensity yet, but it was the same type of sensation where it was like this really strange tingling feeling. So I hadn't been feeling well the week prior, which we'll get to. Um, and what that could have been, we will talk about, but I was out sick the week prior and I'm never usually out sick, but I, I was pretty sick and it felt like the flu or something like that. So this was actually my first day back in the office after four days of being out. And so one of my colleagues, he's like, Bree, he's like, you've, you've been sick. This is your, you just came back to the office. Maybe, maybe you need a protein shake. Okay. He was he was convinced that like I just hadn't gotten nutrients, like my body was still recovering. I'm like, that feels like it could check out. That makes sense. Like I haven't really been eating much. Maybe I just need some sustenance and nutrients. And, and you didn't have COVID when you were homesick. No. The week before. Okay. No. But that's what I, I want to get to because okay. obviously that was major speculation, but it, mm-hmm. it was not COVID. So I had a protein shake, didn't work at all. (laughs) We thought maybe that that could cure it and that wasn't it. So I made it through the rest of the day. At that point, by the end of the day, the feeling was really intense, but I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to sleep this off. Whatever it is, I had convinced myself that it was just the aftermath of being sick Mm -hmm. and that was that and I would be fine for the next day. So we just went off with this plan to go into remote learning and remote work. And I went home that night and still the sensation was not lessening. It was intensifying. And some people might be familiar with RLS, restless leg syndrome. Yes. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. hate that. So that was really the onset that night. So I realized that after this sensation, my legs started getting restless to the point where I couldn't fall asleep because they were so awake, so agitated, so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So as the night went on, I had to continue to wake up and stand and walk around to try to shake out my legs, try to get the sensation out. It's like a twitchy feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the RLS actually like, wasn't really part of the diagnosis at all. It's just one of those things that I've experienced it before and I knew what it was. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, it's just such a pain. You can't fall asleep because your legs keep you up. And that it was exactly what was happening. But as the night progressed, I was waking up more and more frequently. And every time I was waking up, I was actually noticing I was getting weaker and it was the last time that I woke up in the morning at about five or 6am when I tried to roll out of bed and I stumbled because I didn't have that strength in my legs. And that was when I was most concerned. And I was like, okay, something is not okay here Mm -hmm. to add to that. When I stumbled I didn't hit my, my face. I don't actually know how I I felt my face or, or my skull or anything like that. But I noticed that this numbing tingling sensation also was taking over my skull and my face. I felt it around in my mouth and around my lips and on my cheeks through my forehead. I was trying to like tap on my skull and I couldn't feel anything. And that was really when I was freaked out. And I was like, okay. I I would think that was really scary. Yeah. That was the moment of 
panic where I'm like, some, something is seriously wrong. And I do, I did what no person should ever do. And I went on the internet. <laughs> oh, oh, the internet. Oh no. The dark black hole on, on the internet. <laughs> I went on the internet to try to figure it out. No, are you alone during all of this? I mean, I, so I had, I had two roommates at the time, but one, both of them were still sleeping. One okay. of them is one of my closest friends. So she woke up, I told her what was going on. I'm like, I think I, I'm going to the emergency room. And, you know, she helped me, but it was, I was basically alone, like trying mm-hmm. to figure this out, you know, right. many hours of you yeah. like freaking and also, out. Like, Freaking out and, and trying not to wake them up as well. Mm-hmm. You walking around the apartment, trying to just like stay. Well, I imagine like, you were like, is this something? Is this not something? What is this? This is so strange. Yeah, it was, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. It was, it was something I had never experienced, but like these feelings I had experienced like pins and needles. And I'm like, I've never heard of extended pins and needles, but also maybe it's RLS. And maybe this is like something that I just developed and my mm-hmm. I'm going to have restless legs. It's just something that I will have to go. You know, it kind of like felt like something strange, but could be manageable because there mm-hmm. wasn't, there wasn't pain at this point. This point was just, again, that tingling sort of numbing sensation. So there, it wasn't painful. And I think that that was for me as a human, that was an indicator that it's like, okay, because I'm not in pain, I can probably get through this. But obviously when I said, when I felt that in my face, when I felt totally numb and there was no sensation in my face, I was like, oh no, this is not okay. That's scary. Yeah. I went on the internet. I was not far off at all, but after I went on and I can, I can tell you about that when I get to the actual diagnosis, but when I went on the internet, after I did that, I then called my parents who I'm very close to my parents Uh, at this time I was 28, but my parents have always been just like my biggest support system. And I called them up and I'm like, something's going on. This is happening. I think I need to go to the emergency room. Like I'm going to bring myself to the hospital. And obviously this was also my first day of remote work. So oh boy, <laughs> it was just like everything happening. I called my boss and I was like, I have to take myself to the hospital. I'm so sorry. Like I can't work today. And I know this is the, the worst timing that could have ever possibly happened, but you know, he was very understanding as well. My team is ama- was amazing at the time, that team. So I take myself to the emergency room. It was a strategic decision based on the hospital that I knew I wanted to go to because Mm -hmm. I knew that NYU has just an incredible hospital in New York and the hospital that's closest to me, unfortunately has like just a, not the best reputation. And I was scared that I was going to go there and not get the care that I needed. Again, if I called an ambulance, I would, it could have been. You wouldn't have control over where you ended up. And we're talking right in the middle of COVID. Exactly. Exactly. So like, I, I was kind of trying to figure out like, do I drive myself? Do I take an Uber? Do I take, do I call the ambulance? So I decided to take an Uber. I put a mask on. I got an Uber. My roommate offered to drive me, but we were all so scared. I'm like, I don't want you going out. Like I, like we're not supposed to be going out at all. Like, I don't want to be putting you in harm's way, bringing you to the hospital with me. Like, so I'm like, let me call an Uber, get myself to the emergency room. So I call an Uber I get to NYU's emergency room. And at this point it has intensified. It happened fast. Mm -hmm. It was like, I woke up and rapidly this thing started to increase where I, I started to feel discomfort and pain that started to radiate through the let through my legs. And so when I got to the emergency room, it was essentially just in time because I be grown so severe that I had to walk my hands along the triage desk. And I told the triage nurse, I think my legs are about to collapse beneath me. And no sooner than I said it, did it happen? Oh, wow. So that was really the start of this super crazy experience for me. And I don't know if you want me to pause there, if there's any questions that you have, but I can definitely sort of continue on the rest of the journey. No, I think just continue on because this is really, I'm so curious to see what happened next. Yeah. So at this point I had said, I started to get that radiating pain, that discomfort that started to intensify quickly. 
So we went from this dull numbing and tingling to really restless, to a dull radiating pain, to a really intense shooting fire-like knife-like pain through my legs. So I do Uh, have a a question. So when you, you're telling the nurse, I think I'm not going to be able to continue standing. And then you did collapse Mm -hmm. and then did that, then you got rushed into Yeah. So I I, I wish I was rushed. Unfortunately, with the hospitals in COVID, it was, I, I was one of a pool of people who were in panic. So I did get taken great care of. And I, and I can say that, but at that time, immediately like a nurse some or someone, I don't, it might've even been the security guard. Someone came and like scooped me up from behind someone rushed and got a wheelchair, put me in a wheelchair and then, and then hurry that, up and wait. <laughs> yeah, hurry up and wait. Yeah. I did get to a bed pretty quickly in the emergency room though, not in the neuro unit, which is where I was for several weeks, okay. but in the emergency room, that's when they had me in the bed that was when this fire-like knife-like pain started to intensify. And at this point I'm screaming in pain. It was that bad. It was that bad. It was zero to 60. I have not had a child yet. So I won't, so I know that there will be a a different type of pain, but thus far in my life at up to those 28 years, it was the most intense pain I had ever experienced. And you are alone because you probably can't have anyone in the hospital with you, right? So that's so, even scarier. It's really funny that you say that. So I had called my parents that morning. I said, I'm going to the emergency room. They were, I was in New York city. They were in Rhode Island. That's where I was born and raised. It's about a four hour drive. If you're not hitting any type of traffic or anything like that. At this point, uh, state borders had been closed. Oh, wow. (laughs) So like you weren't supposed to leave if you had a Rhode Island license plate, if you were seen crossing state lines, like no one knew there was just all Mm. these different things that could happen. You're supposed to stay in your state, but my parents got in the car, they made it happen. They rushed to the emergency room. But while I was in the emergency room at the time, they weren't there yet. And I'm on the phone with my mom crying in pain, like saying, like, I need help. I don't know what this is. Like, and then I can hear my father on the phone through both through my mom's phone and coming through at the emergency room desk (laughs) being like, someone needs to help my daughter. Like she's like, something's not right. Like, you know, just my concerned parents, again, my biggest support system. So Mm -hmm. they're trying to help me. They're trying to get to me. I am in just the most intense pain I've ever felt. And my parents do get there. At this point, they get there. I've been taken up to the neuro unit. So NYU neurology is really where I ended up. And I can talk about why specifically this was a neurological case, but I ended up in the neuro unit. And I was, if you think about like any movie where like someone needs to be quarantined and like people are in like hazmat suits, Mm -hmm. that was essentially where I was. So I was put in, felt like a, a, a high room at the, at, you know, that no one knew about that had, it was a double or a triple door entrance so that every time one door closed, you yeah. would scrub in another, you'd have to make sure you were sanitized and then another, and then they got to me. So and, I was- and this, this is because of COVID they, because they don't know what this is that you exactly. have. Right? Exactly. Okay. And there was for sure, major speculation that this could Mm -hmm. have been COVID induced. Yes. So at this point, I'm in this crazy quarantined hospital room with people wearing big white hazmat suits around me. I do remember seeing a flash of my mom. So at the time, my parents finally arrived my dad had to stay in the car, I think for several reasons. One, because they were really nervous that they had Rhode Island plates. So they were trying to maneuver that, but also the fact that I think because of the situation I was in, because they didn't know they would only let in one person at a time, kind of like at their own risk. And I remember seeing a flash of my mom. I remember she was holding, I had like a bunch of earrings in at the time and she like had my thing of all the, all my jewelry. And I don't really remember much else, but I remember, in that moment, because I was going through every test possible on all these different medications, I fell asleep, I guess, or went under whatever it might've been. 
woke up and she wasn't there. And mm. I was told that in that time, New York City hospitals were mandated to lockdown. Wow. I mean, this was really in the thick of it. This was the thick of it. So I just got chills saying that. Yeah, me too, because it's like, we've kind of forgotten some of this stuff that we all were exposed to. Yeah. Crazy times. Crazy times. So they had to leave. My mom had to leave the hospital and I was alone and Mm. I didn't know what was going on. I was absolutely terrified. At this point, I had no mobility left. So it wasn't like I could even, after I collapsed in the emergency room, it was really difficult for me to even like raise my legs, bend my knees in the bed. I needed someone to help me uh, to really hold me up to walk to the bathroom or anything like that. Several hours later at this point, after waking up after all these tests, I have 100% no mobility from the waist down. From the waist down, but you still have your arms and your hands. and I still have, yep, full mobility in my arms and hands. And from the neck up, I had limited mobility and still that numbness and that tingling sensation, but I, I was still able to talk. I could still move my neck. I was uncomfortable, but I still had mobility there, which was good. So from there. Now, were you um, still in pain? Are you still in pain or have they been able to alleviate the pain? I was still in not as intense pain that I was, but it was, I was still in pain for sure. Also because uh, not only from what was going on, but they had to do things like a spinal tap. Oh yeah. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had just, there was just so much getting pumped through me and prodded into me on top of this radiating pain. It was just a very uncomfortable and scary experience. So the my friends like to joke that at this point they had they had run absolutely every test that they could have run i mean from neuro things to hereditary possible like they ran every a battery of tests and they couldn't find anything everything was coming up negative that's why you know a spinal tap is a pretty serious testing method that mm-hmm. you know so they couldn't figure out anything. Um, And I was going to say, my friends like to joke that at this time, it was the point that COVID tests were brand new Mm -hmm. and celebrities couldn't even get their hands on them. And I was given three COVID tests, which all came back negative. Mm. And so at that time they had to rule it out. I myself, as well as doctors that I've had, will always continue to speculate that had the test been more accurate, more, more advanced as they are now, it might've yielded a different result. And I'll just never know at this Mm -hmm. point, it was considered, it was a negative test. So we just kind of move forward with that, Mm -hmm. but doctors couldn't give me an answer and conversations that were being had were this could progress and get worse. This, this could take over more of your body because we just aren't figuring it out right now. This could lead down a a more difficult path, sort of speaking like end of life. They weren't, they really couldn't tell me. Oh, that's terrifying. Terrifying. You know, we talked about possible amputation. Oh my God. There was just like, they and were, here you are, 28 years old, all alone in this hospital room. Mm-hmm, exactly. Just absolutely terrified. It took several days for them to finally come up with a result. And in those several days, again, obviously, I was scared. I was alone. I So much was going through my mind. I'm trying to be optimistic, but it's tough to be optimistic in such a fresh and scary situation that you just don't know what the outcome will be. And several days later, they finally came up with a diagnosis. And what's interesting is that the diagnosis and the reason why it was not on any list of things for them to really check is that it's a very rare medical condition on its own, but it's exceedingly more rare for adults because it actually happens in young children. So it was not even on their radar to look at immediately, but what it is, what the very long name is called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. If anyone listening wants to look it up, you can look up the acronym ADEM. ADEM is, is what it 
goes by. And what that diagnosis actually is, is my immune system has a basically a false trigger response that it will go in and attack the healthy cells in my brain and in my spine. So interestingly, the immune system trigger is triggered by viruses and Mm -hmm. vaccines. So not only was this a something that was really going to be difficult for me to tackle in that moment and in those moments, but as you can imagine over these past several years of being in a post-COVID world, we've all struggled between viruses and vaccines. Mm-hmm. Do what what risk do we take as a healthy human being? I'm here knowing that both of them are a, a life-threatening risk for me. Yeah. So you probably haven't been able to to take the vaccine. So it I feel very blessed that this February, I was finally able to take it basically uh, almost a year after everyone in my age group or health health bracket was able to because the condition is so rare and there was really no medical evidence to show what would happen. So I really had to t- get it at my own risk. I was going to say that must have been terrifying to, to, to get it. Like, it was do I or don't I? Do I, do I risk mm-hmm. getting the virus again, uh, mm-hmm. perhaps again? Yeah. And yeah. triggering this whole thing all over again. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. So it was that was, that's kind of like, you know, how it how it's been and the, what I've had to sort of work through and figure out. And it's been really difficult as well prior to and I know we're kind of going on a, a little bit of a tangent, but even prior to me getting vaccinated because the COVID vaccine was so heavily pushed for workers to go back into the workplace, I had a, my medical medical note from my neurologist, my doc, from every doctor possible saying that I am not advised to get this vaccine right now, but it made it really, really difficult. And the reason why I actually pivoted to going full-time into my business this past year was because I was having a really challenging time navigating my medical exemption with vaccine mandates because the exemptions in the man in this vaccine mandate hadn't been established anywhere. Mm. So, and and for, for a while I thought like, okay, this actually feels like it needs to be case law because there is no advocacy for people who physically can't get the vaccine, even though I, I, for me personally, and I know it's a personal choice, but for me personally, if I was able to get it right away, I would have gotten it Mm -hmm. because that, no, that was that would have been my personal choice and I couldn't. So there, there was so much to navigate. It's just caused me to go down different paths and different lanes in my life because it's the time period that we're in and the medical place that I'm in, I've had to sort of carve my own way through. Because you have to live with this the rest of your life, right? You always have to be so careful because you never know when you could pick up a virus that could trigger or Mm. a vaccine, even other vaccines, right? Exactly. 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 So, and that's one of those things too, that I do a lot of speaking on because I, as a human being, it's unfair for me to live my life in fear, but I also need to be to the best of society's ability accommodated for exemptions when they are necessary, even when we're living in unprecedented times. So it's a sticky place because I don't live my life in fear. I still live my life. I I know that there's a place in my heart that holds that fear and that Mm -hmm. caution and caution is definitely a way that I will move through life and in situations at this point, but also, I know that I am being unfair to myself if I was to continue to live life in sort of cowering in fear of not getting a virus or a vaccine or something of the sort. I just, I live with caution, but not with fear. Yeah. Well, and because no one should have to live with fear like that. And I imagine for some people, it could be so easy to just exist in total terror and fear and never leave your house because you're so scared, but 
I admire so much that you have found a way to step out of that fear, live your life. But as you said, you're careful, mm-hmm. as careful as you can be, I imagine. Right. And I, I, like I said, you know, it has, it has felt more reassuring that I did go through that, the, the risk of getting the vaccine and, and hoping that it would prove to be successful and not detrimental for me. And it was. So I know that as those things advance, there's going to be more that I might have to get. And again, it's, it's going to be a a choice every time, but Mm -hmm. right now I'm feeling okay where I am at and it's kind of the safety level that I've been able to get to. Yeah. So can, can we go back now to (laughs) there you are in the hospital, they figure out what it is. So then how do you get better? Yeah. So they, they figure out what it is and they do basically this, this trial medication that was going to take about five days to fully get into my system. And then that would be somewhere around day three, day four, day five, they would hope that something would happen and, and could get systems back and running and, and mobility back up and going. So I did go on this medication and I, it was day three or four for me that I would wake up every morning and look down at my legs. And it's a, it's a really interesting thing that I never planned on experiencing when you, when your mind and your body don't connect, Mm -hmm. because I would look at my legs and I would know that just a few days ago, I had full ability to use them. And I would look and I would try to lift them and I'd be thinking that I'm lifting them, but I wasn't actually lifting them. I try to bend the knee and it's, it's, I think the best way to describe it is, is frustrating. Because mm-hmm. I'm like I'm looking and I'm like, why can't I bend my knee? Like I, I, it's so, it's a simple function and I just couldn't do it. I would look at it and I couldn't do it. It's so, like, come on knee, come on. Bend. So I would go through this process every morning. I, I would try to lift both legs. I wasn't able to, I try to bend both knees. I couldn't do that. Try to move my feet or roll my ankle. Wasn't able to. And then I try to wiggle my toes. And on that third or fourth day, I sort of went through the whole process. And then I got to my toes and I finally wiggled a toe. And (laughs) it was, was a celebratory moment for me. For You must have been like, did it, did it really move? Let let me do it again. Let me do it again. And when I tell you it was a fraction of a millimeter, like, I don't think anyone else would have seen it, <laughs> but you knew it. You knew it. I knew it. I felt it. I saw it happen. I didn't even think I could do it again after that point, but I saw it happen. And that was like that very tiny sliver of hope that mm-hmm. uh, really helped pull me through. And from there, I was in the hospital on my 29th birthday and I did miraculously take my first steps on that day. So my first steps again, as you had Mm -hmm. said, and that's where so much of the magic of this journey has happened is in walking, learning how to walk again, consciously learning, actually seeing my body and watching and learning with my body, the process that is learning how to walk. That was. Yeah. So how, how long was this process till you got to your 29th birthday from when this all started? Are we talking weeks or a couple weeks, a couple yes. weeks. Couple so weeks. that is really interesting. The way you just phrased that, that consciously mm-hmm. learning how to walk again and really consciously becoming aware of your body in a different way, because so often we take for granted everything that our bodies do for us. And to have that fully in the moment, paying attention Mm -hmm. to every aspect of what was happening. Yeah. And, and that's really one of these key points for me and that I really infuse with the work that I do is our levels of consciousness are varied, but when we take something like walking, the first time we learned how to do it, we were sort of like semi-conscious or subconscious human beings. We could feel and emote and we knew instinctually, you know, what was going on. We were just starting to sort of develop sensory and motor skills and learning how to walk is not something that we remember doing. I, maybe there are a few people (laughs) who might be able to, I'll never say everyone, but 
most of us, I would argue, cannot remember that process. We just, Mm -hmm. it was more of an instinctual process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We fall down, we get up, we fall down, we get up. We, we, we realize that our hands can stop us and hold us and keep us from being safe. If we fall, you, you learn instinctually at that point. And so Parents who have seen the process happen and have watched their children learn how to walk have some idea of what's taking place. But again, that that self-conscious piece, not being self-conscious, but like self-consciousness of being conscious of oneself really changes that dynamic. Because when you see a process being performed by your body that was once instinctual and automated and now needs to be relearned. One, you understand the incredible power that you have as a human being, just the power of our mind and body and what we are capable of doing. But you also illuminate everything else that could have possibly been unconscious or automated. So for me, learning how to walk, it opened up this idea and this possibility of understanding what else in my life have I automated and never given a second thought to that could possibly change my whole perspective on the way I think, feel, believe, and do. So the consciousness piece is something that was really pivotal and really remarkable for me because it brought a lot to the surface of understanding myself, my capabilities, and also, again, that power that we have that when we bring it to light, when we illuminate it into our consciousness, there is an unmatched power between the mind and the body to work together. Yeah, this is really, really fascinating. and. So you're walking, but then you have this, this, this new way of thinking in your mind. And then, so you said you wanted to look at other things in your life. Did you just go on this journey of self-exploration and start looking at things? It's, it's something that I've almost, I think the best way to put it is that what I discovered was that not only was I automating processes in my life, but I was automating my consciousness. And that was the shift for me. I realized that in life, in all of our lives, but in varying degrees, we automate things to get by, to do what we have to do, because that is both the way that our world is. We have, we live in a very fast paced environment, whether you're in New York city or not, I understand that life comes with a lot to juggle. And we automate because that's a human system that makes things really possible for us to handle several things at a time, to be able to do multiple things at once, so to speak. But consciousness is something that that I realized I had been automating because it was as if I would only really pay attention to the things that I really enjoyed doing. Or, or when it was time to relax at the end of the night, like I could just like be in the moment with myself, Mm -hmm. but it was like, my consciousness was, was flipped off for all of the other parts of life going through the day to day and going through work and doing all X, Y, Yeah. I think we really do that. Driving the car. You, I, I, when you have that, you're like, Oh, how'd I get here? (laughs) You're just on autopilot while you're driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our minds wander. We Mm -hmm. go in different places. We have, as human beings, again, especially in the time that we're in, especially with the mass amount of stimulation and inputs and screens that we're working with, it is, everything is quick changing and ever moving. And that is the way that our mind has really started to adapt as well as consciousness piece is like, we have this flicker from here to there, to there, to there, to there. And we can't just focus our attention on all of these things. So we, our consciousness almost like falls, falls back, lets us do our things and then comes back to the forefront when it's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So for me, I realized that I have this spotlight 
that I can shine on things. That spotlight is my consciousness. I actually have the ability to bring it forward and put full focus into something and also understand what can be changed or altered to make this something better or more fulfilling or, or something that I will appreciate or value more. And this go, this is for anything from my morning routine to checking my emails, that monotonous work. There's just so much that we as human beings can shift in our lives and generate much more positive outcomes if we have the courage to shine that spotlight on it. So can you give an example? Yeah. So for me, I I mentioned routines. Mm -hmm. So routines were huge. And again, routines, a lot of them are automated. But in the morning, I was getting up. I (laughs) I would use to hit the snooze a lot. And again, that's a I was doing it unconsciously because I wanted to stay in comfort, but I flip my conscious on, I can just turn off the alarm and jump out of bed because I know, again, I'm not trying to do this mindlessly. I want to do this mindfully. Mm -hmm. So turning off that alarm is a really small example, but it put, it also sets you up for the rest of your routine. Now, a lot of times in the morning as human beings often will be is groggy, tired, trying to get your bearings and I was able to really sort of adjust my morning routine so that I could energize myself and be consciously in those moments in the morning because I realized the importance of them. And it set me up incredibly for the rest of my day. So there is a a physical activity. So moving my body, even if it's just five minutes in the morning, just to get that sort of wake my body up mode mental simulation. So I'll do both a meditation as well as reading, even if it's just five pages of reading, Mm -hmm. but all three of those things, physical activity, mental stimulation, meditation are three key components that I wasn't implementing, not because I couldn't or didn't have the power to, but because I had not shine that spotlight on my morning routine to understand where I could improve it and make my life vastly improve. Wow. I think that's so true. I think we go through our morning sometimes just on autopilot. Oh, we got to brush your teeth. We got to grab that cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. We got to throw some clothes on, or if you've got kids, you've got to run around and get them ready. And we're just on autopilot. So I think that's so awesome. It's taking what little things, you know, it doesn't have to be huge things, right? Little things that you can do to make Mm -hmm. it more meaningful, I think for yourself, right? Yeah. So how did this all evolve into this business that you have now? And tell us about that. Absolutely. So for me, I, well, first I was in the mental health field to begin with. So When this had all happened, I was only a year out of grad school working for that education company doing counseling in in several different schools, but that was just my first year as a counselor. So I had studied counselor in a therapeutic sense. I I had studied to become a therapist and was just doing that therapeutic counseling work for a year after this. And I knew that I've always wanted to stay steady in that track. That was definitely where I saw myself as as being powerful and productive human being. I really understood my impact in the mental health space, but I also knew something that was sort of like a, a lifelong dream of mine is I wanted to speak and be able to impact others. And I really didn't know for the longest time what that even would look like, what I would speak on, how I would impact. And then when I happened on upon mental health and really went down that track, I found my passion there. And I was like, okay, like I know that I would be able to speak in the realm of mental health, but how, what am I going to actually speak on? What topics do I pick? Do I have stories to tell? And Mm -hmm. so it was almost like this was all in the back of my head for a long time. And then I went through this experience and the experience also brought me on, which we 
haven't really touched on, but brought me on this journey of running from learning how to walk to running and sort of finding this space where I just absolutely thrive. And that's when I'm running as, and it's not, I'm not saying I thrive as a runner. I actually don't have a, a quick run time as, at all. <laughs> I, thr- I thrive as a human being when I am running. Yeah. It's when the, everything for me comes alive because it's a different experience for me. I have that mind body connection there that I built consciously learning how to do it again. So when I run, it's not monotonous physical activity. Yeah. It is almost like a a transcendent experience. I was going to say, it's like you found this joy because Mm -hmm. look what my body's doing now. And I almost lost all of this. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So not only did I have this medical journey, but the journey that it brought me on with running and the power that that has brought me and the perspective that that has brought me and the understanding of who I am and who human beings are and can be, it all has come through sort of the, the back to the front end of that medical and running experience. So I finally felt like I, was like, I have something to talk about now. Mm-hmm. And though I'm now realizing that I could have still had power and impact picking mental health topics and speaking on those and doing that. I wouldn't have the, the personal connection behind it. And I Mm -hmm. felt like this story has sort of been that glue that's brought everything together. I'm a believer that we go through things for a reason. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's to find out who we are or to to make a profound shift in our lives. That's why sometimes these difficult, painful, horrible things happen. And because it's like, I've talked about this before. It's like being the Phoenix coming out of the ashes. It's, Mm -hmm. but we come out of it and we come out of it changed and different and maybe with a new passion, or like Mm -hmm. you said, you found your voice yeah. what you wanted to talk about. Yeah. And then it's unfortunate we have to go through these really difficult things, but I don't know why, but it <laughs> seems like that just makes it deeper and more powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My two cents, but <laughs> that, it is so spot on though, what you're saying. And that's one of the things too, like we will never know why things happen to us in those moments those lessons don't come or that understanding doesn't come until far down the road. Yep. It's, it's almost never, I would argue. And again, I can't say, I can't give absolutes, but I would say it's almost never that we find that why in the moment. Right. It, Cause it, you're in it. You're in the thick of it. You're exactly, you can't see above the weeds. <laughs> ex- exactly. It's like, you need to go through that struggle to get out of it to be able to look in hindsight and then understand. Mm-hmm. And, well, and and look what you found through it. And not everybody will find it, but mm-hmm. you found yeah. meaning and depth and yeah, so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, it again, it's brought that, uh, it really was sort of the piece of the puzzle that has brought this vision that I've had for myself and what I want to do for so long into fruition. I started my podcast right away, started, well, not right away, but very soon after my running experience started, I started my podcast and started detailing my story and talking about it. And that led, that is now two years running. From there, I brought in, really started the business, realized how I can help others. And by both speaking to groups and small groups and businesses. And I've done large keynotes as well. So that speaking component then drives the rest of the business as me as a helper in the helping profession and how I can help impact either small groups or larger groups as well. And what this consciousness piece, our self-efficacy, the ability to self-actualize, all of these things that I've sort of been able to pull out of my story I'm now able to speak on and help individuals and groups learn. So it do, is. Do you work with individuals or are you primarily just in the group? I do individuals as well. I actually right now, so I have done emotional wellness coaching and that is really for individuals who have experienced something 
and it's put them in an emotional place that they're not used to or not comfortable with. And they sort of need emotional fitness training is what I call it. So a lot of things is something with a relationship, a breakup or a divorce, a major medical experience. Like I had that sort of shifted life, a really death, bereavement, grief, those types of things. So that's the coaching aspect. And that's where I really work with individuals. And I make that distinction because I'm also at this point, I'm a certified school counselor, which we've spoken about, which allows me to work in a therapeutic capacity with children who are adolescents who are 18 and under. So at this point right now, and it will confer in May, 2023, I'm working on my clinical mental health counseling license, which essentially expands my ability to use therapy in an individual capacity with adults and children. So people of any age. So I really make the distinction between the individual coaching that I do and then Mm -hmm. the, the counseling that I right now have the ability to do, and then we'll be able to expand in about a year because I want to make sure I make the distinction that Currently, mental health wise, I don't work specifically with pathology, meaning what might be dysfunctional or abnormal in someone's way of living. I just deal with sort of moments. So like I said, grief moments, moments where we've been shaken up by life and Mm -hmm. we need to sort of be unshaken. Yeah. A little help to get through things. Yeah. So if somebody wants to work with you, Brie, well, how do they do that? How do they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So I am very open at this point, currently booking out the end of 22 and 2023 for speaking engagements and workshops, as well as continuing to work on coaching. And I will be able to do counseling in 2023. But if anyone wants to be able to work with me, reach out, wants me to speak, do a workshop or coaching, you can find me. My website is brieundeniably.com. That's B-R-I-U-N-D-E-N-I-A-B-L-Y.com. And all of my social platforms, you can also find me at Brie Undeniably. So anywhere you type in YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, you're going to find me <laughs> at Brie Undeniably. And your podcast, same same name? Podcast, same name. Yes. Yep. Okay. So I have a speaker series right now under Brie Undeniably. So you can just type in Brie Undeniably. You'll find it there. Awesome. And Brie, if you had to leave our listeners with one message, what would it be? I love this question. It is my (laughs) favorite way to leave listeners. And the message is both the mantra, the tagline, sort of the, the full encapsulation of what I stand by and what my business really promotes. And that is to buy into the possibility of you, which means that we can't always see what our ability or possibility is in front of us. Not only can't we see it, but it's often not even in our peripheral. It's often somewhere so far outside of our vision that it's tough for us to even imagine it. But if we can offer ourselves the understanding that we are capable beyond what we can see, we're able to reach for that possibility and that potential that has been inside of us all along. So understanding you don't have to see it in yourself to be able to make it happen. And if you buy into the possibility of you, you're buying into the fact that you know your possibility is extended beyond who you are right now. I love that. And thank you for saying that. I I love that. Just, is it just possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? Yeah. Anything hope. is possible. Yeah. yeah. You know, hope is a really important element in in the helping profession in general. If you have someone who comes to counseling and they have, they brought themselves there, even though they have no other idea of how they're going to get through it, they brought themselves there and hope they can get there. Mm. And studies show that those individuals see massive success just based off of the seed of hope that they had to get it started. So it's really important. I love that as well. And it it takes courage to reach Mm -hmm. out and get help, Mm -hmm. but it's, 
it's an awesome thing. So, so listeners, don't be afraid to take yeah. that step and Im- imagine the possibilities mm-hmm. of your own life. Brie, yeah. gosh, this was a really fascinating story. And I am so glad that you recovered. I think you're hundred percent recovered. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You're yeah. running. That's running a- daily. Yeah. Yeah. And that you found this new passion, this new platform, this new way of thinking mm-hmm. and creating, and that you are here to share it with everyone. So yeah. I will be putting all of this into the show notes for our listeners so that they can find you. And I just want to say thank you for, for being here and being willing to share. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. I appreciate you sharing your platform. And I hope that we were able to help listeners and inspire them to buy into that possibility. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Unbreakable Spirit. To learn more about Jennifer and her holistic weight loss approach, visit her website at sevencompany.com. That's the number seven, company.com. And please join us for our next episode where we'll hear from more women who overcame hardship and learned how to thrive.